pulpit down a little bit closer to you guys. You know, <laughs> maybe we'll do that. Maybe, maybe you'll have a preacher on the move tonight, but welcome. Glad to have you here tonight. Uh, we're going to do, uh, as Pastor Chris said this morning, we're uh, doing First John throughout the, uh, uh, the summer months. Uh, I think we're going to do First John, Second, and Third John, actually. And uh, so there's going to be various teachers uh, uh, teaching and preaching. I've, I'm slated for tonight. I believe next week it's uh, Mr. Mr. Hilton, Pastor Hilton. So I just encourage you to come out. Read the passage, read before you come and just prepare your heart. So uh, I know there's a lot of things happening, you know, uh, this summer, and I just encourage you to stay up to date. A lot of Bible studies, the ladies' Bible studies, and I'll get these wrong, but I believe they're on Wednesdays and Thursdays every every other week. This week is the Thursday, and next week is the Wednesday. Uh, We have a couple of men's Bible studies, the coffee club, and then uh, Wednesday night we're doing Man in the Mirror. So if you can come to that, I just encourage you. It's an old book, but it's a a classic book because it talks about the uh, 20 qualities of an aspiring man, a man that what a man should look like as he walks with the Lord. So just encourage you to come out and be a part of that. But anyway, glad you're here, and let me pray for us, and uh, we'll be done. So, Lord, thank you for this evening. I pray your blessings on our time here. Uh, Pray your blessings on the music, on the message. Uh, God, may you be glorified. We have come to worship and honor you as our Lord and our God, and we do, again, just commit this time to you. Pray that you, Lord, would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. the same hymnal as you guys. Uh, We're going to get started with number 473 in your hymnals if you'd like to stand. Victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory how he
<laughs> Just you wait.
stay seated. Well, I, I, let me turn me on here. I did it again. Uh, we're actually studying the measure of a man on uh, Sunday, on, on Wednesday. I'll get the right day too. And uh, maybe I need to read the other book. You know, I've been ta- thinking about it, so maybe I just need to uh, read it. But we are doing the measure of a man on uh, Wednesday nights. And it's actually a classic, so come on out, be a part of that. It's what every uh, believer, I think every believer should try to aspire to be. So tonight we're going to be in uh, uh, 1 John chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. And uh, so let me pray for it. Let me read the passage and then I'll pray for us and we'll see what God has for us. So this is 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. It says, my little children, I'm writing these things so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. For he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God is truly perfected. By this we know we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought also to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old one, which you have had from the beginning, an old commandment. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I'm writing to you a new commandment to you, to which which is true in him and in you, because darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. So let's pray. God, we do thank you again for this evening, and we thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, as we look at this passage that you would open the eyes of our heart, that we can see and understand who you are and what uh, uh, you're doing. Pray that we would, as the, the passage stands, that we would keep your commandments. That it's not a new commandment, but it's an old one. So Lord, I just pray that you would give us wisdom. I pray that you would uh, use the words that I'm going to speak tonight to, uh, just to edify, to build us up, to cause us to look to you. And we pray in Jesus' name. You know, um, if you'll put that, pat, there it is right up there. We got a, our advocate. You know, there's a reason why, why John is writing this. And we're going to talk about that. It's found in the first two verses. And the reason is very simple. It's so that you may not sin. And, and again, we're going to look at that. And then uh, in, verse two, uh, in chapter 2, verses 3 and 6, we're going to look how we know that we are believers. And it, the simple answer is that you're obedient to the Word of God. I mean, that is the simple answer. And if you're not obedient to the Word of God, the truth is not in you and you're a liar. That's what, kind of what Pastor Chris said this morning. It's what the passage says here tonight. And, you know, the passage here, if, if you don't do this... You're a liar. I mean, these are not simple words. They are stark words. And they don't, he, John, doesn't pull punches. And then the last one, it's not a new commandment. But it is a new commandment. It's not a new commandment in the fact that you know all this stuff. It's a new commandment in how we are to apply this to our lives and how we are to walk in that command, these commandments. Because I believe there's, there's ten but Jesus bulls them down to two. So that's kind of where we're going tonight. So let's look at the first reason. The reason for him to write. He says, this is the first part of chapter, of verse one, I should say. It says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. So you got to ask yourself, what things are, is he writing to us? Think back about, five hours 
Oh, wait just a minute. Think back about seven hours. Today's message. You know what Pastor Chris was talking about. He was talking about lacks of the past two Sundays. You know, we see in, in verse 5 of chapter 1, this is the message we have heard that in Him He announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. Whereas light symbolizes purity and holiness and darkness is the opposite. And, and you know, and the thing about it is we all, everybody here at one time in our life, we, if you're believing at one time in your life, you walked in darkness. The darkness that he's talking about. And I could tell you a story about walking up a stairwell in Moldova, pitch dark night. Uh, there's no street lights. There's no moonlight. There's no stairwell lights. I got lost going from the first floor to the sixth floor. I had to go back down and start over and count the the the. The, the floors so I could get to where I, that's the kind of darkness that we're talking about there was a mugger in that room I would have been safe because he wouldn't have been able to see me <laughs> complete utter darkness that's that's how we once walked but now as as believers we walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness light being holiness Darkness being the opposite. Again, that's what Pastor Chris, he was talking about the three spiritual tests uh, or the three tests of spiritual life and fellowship with God. You know, the, the, and in that, I look at it, there's five conditional statements there in those passages. And again, John is writing these things. What, think about what Pastor Chris said this morning. He's writing these things so that you may not sin. That's what the passage says. So that we can walk with clean hands, pure heart. I mean, that's, that's our goal. That's, that's Richard's goal. And, and he falls desperately short every day. And maybe not in my actions, but in my thoughts. Maybe not in my thoughts, but my words. Somewhere I, I, I struggle with this. And one day, one day, I will have the victory. Praise the Lord, but I'll be with the Lord and away from you guys, which might be a good thing for you guys. <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, this is God's desire for every believer. I mean, you think about that. This is what he wants in your life. Well, he goes on in, in verse uh, 1 and 2, and he tells us when we do sin, we have a helper. A helper so that, so that this advocate, as he calls him, comes alongside us and helps us restore that fellowship with the Father. It says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. We have an advocate. God's desire is that you may not sin. Yet when you do, there is a provision made. And his name is Jesus. He, he's like our defense Lord. He's on our side. Jesus Christ, the advocate. And the word here, and I know I'm going to mispronounce this. I'm not a great Greek scholar. I have a great Greek program, but it's Paracletus, someone that comes alongside, someone that provides help. We again, we have an advocate. Jesus is our defender, and when we sin today, uh, you know, all our sins of today, all our sins, past sins, all our present sins, all our future sins are covered. I remember, again, I was talking with Pastor Nikolai. He's a pastor in Moldova. And we were talking about this passage. And he struggled with this. And I said, but brother, none of your sins were committed when Jesus died. And he stopped for a minute. And it's like, okay, but if I tell my people this, if I tell them this, then that 
might give them a license that they can go and do whatever they want. And that's not at all what Jesus is saying here. That's not all, at all what John is writing here. You know, the, the idea here, you know, we see in verse 6, it says, if we say we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie. And the idea here is if we stand, we're standing accused in a courtroom uh, before a righteous judge, God the Father, the accuser of the brethren is there. The adversary, yes, the accuser of the brethren is bringing accusations against you. He has a list there, and he just throws them at you constantly. All of which are true. All of which are true. But our, our advocate, he stands up and answers the charges saying, Richard is completely guilty, Your Honor. In fact, I know firsthand that Richard's done a lot more than the accuser is accusing him of. And now he makes a full and complete confession before you. The gavel slams down. The judge asks, what shall his sentence be? And our advocate answers, his sentence shall be death. He deserves, Richard deserves, the full wrath of this righteous court. You know, and you can just hear the galleries, you know, the accusers just screaming, yeah, we're guilty. That's, that's the bottom line. We're guilty. We've admitted our guilt. And now there's the punishment phase of the trial. But then, the advocate steps up and says, this one belongs to me. I paid, I paid the price. I took the wrath. I took the punishment that he deserves. I bore it on the cross. I bore it on the cross. The judge rules, guilty as charged, penalty satisfied you have an advocate you know when when Jesus was on the cross he says it is finished it was completely finished your past is under the blood of Jesus all the sins that you committed the heinous sins that you committed the trite sins that you committed in the past are dealt with. If you've confessed them, and if you've put them before the Father, they are under the blood of Christ. You don't have to allow the enemy to beat you up, to, to throw them back up in your face, because they are done. They are finished. The worst, heinous sin that you can think of. That's an awesome thought because I, I did a lot. <laughs> I did a lot when I was a kid. And I, I just, I'm, you know, yeah. And I'm sure some of you are the same way. They're done. You know, my present sins, they're under the blood of Christ. And I'm trying, I am trying to take every thought captive. I am trying to walk in the light as he is in the light. I'm trying to do all these things, but I fall desperately short every day. My sins are covered by the blood of Christ. You know what? Tomorrow, when I wake up in the morning and I am on my way to work and that person's in front of me driving about 10 miles an hour and I'm screaming and hollering at him, my sins are going to be covered. Praise the Lord. I told, I, yeah, it's awesome. The penalty has been completely paid by Jesus Christ. No deferred judification, no probation, case closed. Simple as that. Now, now I, I want to say this. As believers, we confess with our mouth. You know, and, and I think, and I believe Pastor Chris said it this morning, confession isn't just saying, okay, God, I did this. 
Confession is saying the same thing that Scripture, that God says about your sin. God, this sin was ugly. It hurt my wife, my whoever it was, and I am guilty. Please have mercy on me. And, and, and that's what confession is. It's not saying, oh, sorry, God, I got caught. It is truly asking for forgiveness. And you know what? If you have to go, go to somebody, if, if you've sinned against your brother or you've sinned against your sister, please go. Please do it. Please deal with it. You know, it's one thing just to walk with, again, with clean hands and a pure heart so that you can have that fellowship restored with the Father. This is what our advocate's done. This is, what, this is why the cross. You know, a human defense lawyer argues for the in, innocence of his client. At least he argues for a reasonable doubt. You know, maybe he did it, maybe he didn't. There might be a reasonable doubt. One or two, maybe the jury, it's a hung jury and they have to start over. But our advocate, Jesus Christ, admits our guilt. He enters a plea on our behalf as the one who makes the atoning sacrifice for our guilt. That's what the second half, the second half of verse 2 is telling us. He, is, uh, he himself is the propitiation for our, for our sins. This means that Jesus is the one who atones for, takes away our sins. And it's not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. That's, that is what the scripture is saying here. The sins of the whole world. He has made it possible for us to come to the Lord. Means that our sins are dealt with. You know, one of my favorite passages in, in, in the New Testament, I got a couple of them, other than Colossians 1.13. This, uh, this is 2 Corinthians 5. Starting in verse 17, going to the end of that chapter. But verse 21, this is what it says. It says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. So let, let me kind of break this down for it. He, being God, made him, Jesus, to be sin on my behalf. So he took my... That's, the cross my sin the sin of the world was placed on him my sin was placed on him even the one's future sins because i wasn't born two thousand years ago my future they were placed on him he made him who knew no sin to be sin on my behalf so that the reason here is so that richard and you can put your name there so that we, so that Richard, so that Sheila, so that whoever you are might become the righteousness of God in him. Awesome thought. I, and that's why I say I can stand before God with clean hands and a pure heart. You know, the really, really awesome word here, propitiation, um, found in Romans 3. It's where Paul is talking about being justified by faith. Uh, but it's also found in Hebrews 9. And if you've not read Hebrews in the last 30 minutes, you know, in the last couple of months, I just encourage you to go read through Hebrews, meditate on chapter 9. Because in the first part of chapter 9, he's talking about the old tabernacle and how the priest would go in uh, every year into the Holy of Holies with the blood of bulls and goats and he at the day of atonement and he would make an atonement for the sins. He had to do this year in, year out, year in, year out, ongoing. But in the second half of chapter nine, it says Jesus went in once for all. And it says it says uh, um, he uh, let me find it here. He secured eternal redemption for us. He entered into a new spiritual heavenly tabernacle. It's an awesome thought here. One in Hebrews, uh, excuse me, in Romans 3 is uh, the act. In, Hebrew, in Hebrews 9 is the place. Same idea here. 
And again, I just encourage you to read, meditate on Romans or on Hebrews chapter nine. Every year, enter into the holy of holies. You know that's why the judge says, "Sin, his, the penalty is is satisfied. It's done. You don't have to worry about." It. Well, let's go on. Let's go on to the next one, how we know. And this is verses 3 through 6. Let me read this to us. It says, By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. By this we know that we have come to know him. The evidence of someone knowing God, walking with the Lord, having fellowship with him, is keeping his commandments. You know, we're not saved by keeping our commandments. We're not saved by doing we're saved by grace through faith but we're saved unto good works and i think this is one of those unto good works think with me for a minute think with me for a minute what are these commandments that he's talking about just you know what y'all can even talk if you want what are these commandments let me ask you this where would we find those commandments Somebody, somebody say Exodus 20. Good job, Bill. We find them in Exodus. We also find them, Bill, say Matthew 22. Wow, Bill's got two stars tonight. You know, we find these t- ten commandments. So the first four in Exodus 20, we, f- we, uh, we find the first four are, are how we honor God. And then uh, five, through, uh, five through ten are how we uh, honor God each other and Jesus sums it up in in uh, in Matthew 22 he says you shall and this is his words you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind and you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophet I struggle with these And I'm sure y'all do too, because y'all know that I'm not the greatest lovable person in the world. You're supposed to say, no, Richard, you are. Come on, you're a great guy, and we all love y'all dearly. And you would all lay down your life for me, because I'm awesome. And then I would call you a liar, (laughs) because you know I'm not. Yeah, I, I struggle with this, with honor. I honor myself most of the time before I honor God. That's the sad part about this. I like me. And I have to consciously think about what I'm doing so I don't put myself before the Lord. So I don't put myself before, before you guys. I have to consciously think through this. You know, we could go, and I want to encourage you, let's turn to, to chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3, and let's read uh, verse 23. It's just on the next page. It says, This is His commandment, that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and we love one another just as He commanded us. So that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and we love one another just as he has commanded us. Now that word, that word believe isn't an intellectual assent. You know, a lot of people believe. I believe, you know, I believe that the Bible's real because I have about 2,500 of them at my house. I don't know how many I have. Just like you guys. We all have excess Bible. I have the very first Bible I got when I became a first a believer. It was, it was, about that thick, it's NIV, 
and it's written all in it, and all my Bibles that I've gotten since then, are just, I just write in them. I've still got it. I, have, I believe that the Bible's there. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this belief is, it's more, again, it's more than an intellectual uh, a belief. It's something that you put your reliance in, your trust in. You are resting your hope of eternity on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Not on yourself, not on anything you've done, but on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And the other one is to love one another. You know, to honor one another. To be kind to one another. And I think love and to be kind. Sometimes, you know, we're, we take advantage and, you know, we aren't so kind to each other. But I think part of, of love is just being nice, polite. Yeah, we can get our point across, but we need to show a little bit of respect, a little bit of, of uh, kindness to people, especially those in the world. You know, that is how they see, that is how they know that, that this is true in our own lives. You know, but there's a warning here. You know, verse 4 says, the one, uh, uh, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Hard words. You know, it is. It's hard words. You know, in other words, the one, uh, if, uh, if one does not live his life, marked by obedience to the Scripture. There's falseness in you. And I don't think he's talking about being perfect in our obedience to Scripture. He's talking about walking in a manner worthy. He's talking about doing what we can. I I was talking to a friend, oh, this has been a couple of years ago, and he was struggling and uh, I asked him, now you want to do this? No. Are you trying to do this? No. Are you fighting against it? Yes. And I said, that's, that's what we need to do. We need to fight against the sin in our lives. And once we realize we have done something wrong, once we realize that we have fallen short of, of that mark, we confess. And again, he's not talking sinless perfection here. Then in, in verse 5 and 6, he makes a link between our obedience and our love for God. He says, But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in, sa- in the same manner. You know, as, a, as, a new, as an old believer, as a new believer, as a believer, period, you know, there's a change in our relationship to sin. There should, let me rephrase that, there should be a change in our relationship to sin. And if there's not a change in your relationship to 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 your sin, you need to ask yourself. You need to get honest with yourself and see if that, you know, the scripture says, examine yourself to see if you're in Christ. I would say the same thing. If you're still loving your sin, you need to examine yourself. You need to examine your confession. You need to examine your life. But there should be a a marked change in our relationship to sin. And, And, you know, this is the thing about it. Sin's not eliminated from our lives. I mean, we're saved from the wrath of God. We're not saved from sin. I know we say he has been saved from sin. If we were saved from sin, we would never sin again. We're saved from the consequences of our sin. That's that's what the cross did for us. You know, here, if if our relationship to our sin hasn't changed, you know, if we, we still long or we love our sins as we once did, there might be an issue. You know, if we long or if we 
brag about uh, our, our sins as we once did, there might be a problem. If we long for plans to sin as we once did, there might be a problem. If, if we fondly remember, you know, I look back on my life and I am completely ashamed at some of the things I did. It just, I'm ashamed of it. And it's, that's what he's talking about. I, <laughs> I was not a good man. And Jesus Christ called me out of darkness, out of the kingdom of darkness, and placed me in the kingdom of his beloved son. And I have been fighting sin for the last 35 years. That's what, I think that's what we need to be doing. We don't need to be placating. We don't need to be uh, uh, giving in to our old nature. You know, this, one, this, one's, this one's, you know, a, a believer is no longer comfortable with habitual sin. You know, habitual sin is something that we... I mean, that's, that's, that's walking in darkness. You know, if you're comfortable in walking in darkness, you need to listen to Pastor Chris's sin, uh, sermon this morning. Again, that doesn't mean that we are, are perfect. It doesn't mean that we walk completely sinless, you know, but if we are comfortable in darkness, there's an issue. Verse 6. Look at, look at what verse 6. It says, The one who abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And again, that, that word walk, it means every area of our life should come under the obedience of Christ. You know, our personal life, our private life, our social life, our social media life, you know, when we get online and nobody's around watching us, that life too, every area of our life should come under the obedience of Christ. Not just Sunday mornings, not just Wednesday nights. Every area of our life should come under, under that obedience. Every area. And, and here, it, it, when you think about this, the thought comes full circle. If we abide in Christ, if we abide, are abiding in Jesus, we're walking uh, just as he walked. And if we just walk just as he walked, we live in obedience. And if we live in obedience, we're abiding in Christ. And if we're abiding in Christ, we walk just as he walked. And the circle continues. Doesn't mean we do this perfectly. Doesn't mean that we don't have issues and sin doesn't still... Because the devil's good. He knows exactly what sin calls your name. And you're walking down the road, you're abiding with Christ, you're following Christ, and he says, hey, Richard, and your attention turns. He's good, and you need to pay attention. Well, let's go on, let's go on to the, to the next. Not a new command. Verse 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one which you have had from the beginning. The old command, which is the word, which you have had. On the other hand, I'm writing you a new commandment, a new commandment to you, which is true, uh, which is true in him and in you, because darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. John is, is uh, in these verses, he's saying, you know, you guys know this stuff. I'm looking around. Some of you guys have been believers longer than I have. You, you all know this. You, you've read, you've studied, you know that you probably can quote the Ten Commandments where I can't. I know where they're at so I can go find them. I know that it's to love God and to love our neighbors, but you can probably quote what Matthew 22 says. Y'all know this stuff. Because you've studied it. Because I've been here 20 years and I've seen, i got to do some of the Bible studies with you guys. So none of this is new. And if you're here and you're new, a new believer, give yourself uh, uh, a couple of years. Because this stuff will come around again. You will uh, 
uh, our Bible studies, they will, our Sunday morning Bible studies, our Wednesday night Bible studies. That's why it's so important that you come to these and you get engaged with these. And, and again, John is saying you know this. And, and in fact, to his audience, these guys have studied this stuff from childhood. They've studied Leviticus. They've studied Deuteronomy. Now it's in Matthew. You know this. The commandment is an old in that it has been proclaimed to John's audience since they first heard the gospel, since they were young kids in the synagogues learning uh, uh, scripture. This is not something new. It is new in the fact because it's a big part of Jesus' message. The commandment is not just to love one another, but it's to love as Christ loved. I think that's what we need to do. We need to look at how Christ and you know Christ he had mercy on people where I want to throw them out on their on their heels he had mercy on them and you look at the people that that Christ ministered to woman at at the well man at the pool of Bethesda you know the man born blind the down and out ministered to these people and that's how we are to love as Christ loved. And that's how the world's going to know that Christ is real. There's a reason John is writing this. So that you will not sin. We know that we have come to know him if we keep him. His commandments. And this commandment is not a new one. It's something that you've had from the beginning, but we need to do it as Christ, as Christ loved. So God, I, I do thank you again for this evening. I do thank you again for your mercy and just this passage and how it is so instructive and this book and how it is so instructive and how we are to live our lives as believers, not just on Sunday morning, but in every day of our lives. And I pray for us. I pray that we would take heed to the message uh, that you, we, we need you. I th- pray that we would take heed to the message that uh, we need to be obedient to your word. Thank you, Lord. You know, I, I want to stop for just a minute. I don't know if there's sin in your life. I don't know. I mean, I know you. I know your name. But I don't know where you're at spiritually. I know I'm looking around and I'm seeing believers. Is there any unconfessed sin in your life? I would just pray that right now, tonight, that you would put it before the Lord. You'd ask for forgiveness. That you would no longer walk in darkness, but you would walk in the light. So again, God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for each person in this room tonight. And I pray for us. I pray that we could forsake this world, pursue you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. tonight so if you'd stand
this one a couple weeks ago. spoken this evening. We just pray that uh, each one of us would go forth from this place uh, encouraged that we have an advocate in Christ and that we would be um, inspired to live in such a way uh, that is in accordance with our call. So we just pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>